So good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. For this morning's study, we are going to delve into Zechariah chapter 6. We're going to look at a few themes that we've looked at in the recent past. We're going to consider the verses that our Heavenly Father would place before us. But before we, we do this, shall we ask him for his guidance in a word of prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you and we come before you. On this Sabbath, we thank you for these Sabbath hours where we may set aside the cares of this week. We thank you for the many blessings, admonitions, situations of guidance, and opportunities of ministry that you have presented before us. We thank you for this time that we may assemble together. We ask, Father, for your blessing today as we open your word. We also ask, Father, for your guidance and blessing upon those that are unable to join us this morning, but that may join later as they view this. Help us now and direct us. May your angels attend us and protect us. May your spirit help our minds to be open to understanding the themes that we are about to address. We thank you, Father, for these opportunities and for these blessings. We praise you for all that you are doing in our lives. Help us now. For this, we thank you. And for this, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, here we have Zechariah chapter 6. Of the four chariots. In the first four, first eight verses, this is what we're going to be looking at. But this is a theme that we have covered multiple times in the past in multiple books. So, Zechariah 6, verse 1. And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. Now, how would Father Miller have looked upon two mountains, especially a mountain of brass. What would he have looked at as this as being a symbol? Any thoughts? Could it be Greece? Could you repeat that, please? Or the Greek mindset. Could it be Greece or the Greek mindset? Well, what was what was the brass? What what would brass have symbolized? Well, I thought it was Greece. That, or the heavens are as brass, like God isn't hearing you because you haven't yielded your life to him. Okay. So when we're looking at something like this, Father Miller would have pointed out Isaiah chapter 48, verse 4, Jeremiah 6, verse 28, and Micah verse 4, or excuse me, chapter 4, verse 13. So if we were to look at this, Isaiah 48, 4 states, because I knew that thou art obstinate, and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy bow, or thy bow, brow is brass. Now, to me, this is an intriguing situation, because what kind of fetters were some of these kings taken into captive with? Brass fetters. Right. Now, Jeremiah 6.28 says to us, they are all grievous revolters, walking with slanderers. They are brass and iron. They are all corruptors. So are these mountains a good thing? Definitely not. So the mountains here that Zechariah is beholding, out of these four mountains, or out of these two mountains, are coming four chariots. The mountains are expressing how obstinate, how necessary it is for us not to be like this. Zechariah 6, verse 2. In the first chariot were red horses. And in the second chariot, black horses. And in the third chariot, white horses. And in the fourth chariot, grizzled and bay horses. And then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, what are these, my Lord? What do we see when we're seeing red, black, white, and then these grizzled and bay horses? What other thoughts come to our minds? Chapter 6 of Revelation. Okay. Help us there, brother. Since we're talking chapter 6, are you talking 
verses four and five? Are you talking beginning in verse two? What what do you see here? Verses two to um to four, I think. Let's see. Okay. Can you help us? Can you enlighten us with this? Do you want me to read them? Could you please? All right. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth to forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the sixth seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And they went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat upon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. And it goes okay. on this, this, this to four, anyway. Okay. Now, how does what we just read here, in looking at these with the mountains that were mountains of brass, and these chariots being read, led by red, black, white, grizzled, and bay horses. Does this, does this tell us anything or show us anything when we look at Micah verse 413? Now, Micah 413 reads as follows. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hoofs brass. And thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. These mountains are a symbol. When we look at this symbol and we look at these horses, is God praising us? No. Not in any way, is he? So as Zechariah's vision continues... And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. Now, are we talking literal spirits, or should we accept the alternate reading of the four winds? In this situation, in these passages, God is showing us that this is worldwide. Because the four winds from the north, the south, the east, and the west, they cover the whole earth. The angel continues. The black horses which are therein go forth into the north country, and the white go forth after them. And the grizzled go forth toward the south country. And the bay went forth, the grizzled went forth, and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walk to and fro through the earth. How many times does he have to repeat this to us? Here we have three times walk to and fro is being repeated in the one verse. Now, Zechariah 6, 8. Then cried he upon me and spake unto me, saying, behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. Now, Mrs. White is fairly fairly direct about this point. She comes back and offers the following. Men are required to receive and to impart from heavenly agencies. So are we to receive and give from the agencies of men, or are we to speak and offer from the agencies of heaven. Just as soon as God institution closed their hearts to the dire necessities of sister institutions and do not make every effort possible to act their part to relieve them, but selfishly say, let them suffer. A time will come when they will have to pass through a similar experience of humiliation. But you do not mean to do this, brethren. I know you will not do this. As I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass, 
In the first chariot were red horses, and in the second black horses, and in the third chariot white horses, and in the fourth chariot grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of the, of the earth. So here, the black horses, which are therein, go forth into the north country, and the white go forth after them, and the grizzled go forth toward the south country. And the bay went forth and sought to go, that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, Get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. They cried he upon me, then cried he upon me, and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go forth, that go toward the north country, have quieted my spirit in the north country. The Lord's eyes are open to the workings of the whole cause of God. Does God ignore anything that is going on within the work at this time? I would think not. So there is... <clears throat> There is nothing unimportant to him in the work at this time. Would you agree with that? Now, when one of God's instrumentalities, which is engaged in doing his work, shall through some lack of judgment fall into decay, let those institutions which are in a more prosperous condition do the uttermost of their ability to lift the crippled institution to its feet and the name of God not be dishonored. We need every faculty that is in Europe to stand in a healthy, wholesome condition before the ungodly world. Let not the angels of God who are ministering unto those who bear the responsibilities see the hearts of God's workers made sad. Already the difficulties have increased day by delay so that it will be a greater expense to cure the bruises and the wounds of the institutions. Now, we have seen many times when that which says that they are to give the word of God, they make a choice more to give the word of man. We have to be able to watch. We have to be able to discern what is going on we will find those that are doing the work of God. And sometimes we will find that those that are doing the work of God may have fallen into disrepair. Zechariah 6, 9. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Take of them of the captivity, even of Heldiah, of Tobijah, and Jedidiah, which are come from Babylon, and come thou the same day, and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Then take silver and gold, and make crowns, and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. And speak to him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Who is being referred to here? Oh, I always thought Christ was, was the branch. Okay. So now, if we are to look at this, if we are to consider this carefully, here is the branch. We are to behold the man that is the branch. Now, did we cover this before in Zechariah 3, verse 8? For Zechariah 3, eight reads, Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. What is to be done with, the, with ones that wish to be among the first, the greatest in the kingdom of God? How did Christ respond to this question? have to be servants of all okay so here is the servant the branch we are to behold him how do we behold christ how did the disciples behold christ what he was doing and saying well in john 145 we read 
Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. We have beheld him. And in Luke 1, verse 78, Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. Now, how is it that we can prove that Christ, the branch, shall build the temple of the Lord? How would we approach that? We allow him to have his way with us, as his way in, way in our lives. We allow him to lead us, to purge us, to build us up. Okay. Now, several weeks ago, we studied Zechariah 4. Zechariah 4, 9 reads, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. Now, Matthew 16, 18 says to us, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do we agree that he is not building the church upon Peter, but upon the understanding that Christ is the Savior? And then in Ephesians 2.20, we read, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. What does it mean to you that Christ is the cornerstone of our faith? The foundation of our faith. The strongest part of that foundation. Exactly. Now in Ephesians 2, 21 and 22, the, Paul continues, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. What are we to be today? How does Peter state that what we are to be? Are we not to be the living stones of the temple of God? Amen. Zechariah 6.13. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Does this say that Christ is going to be a building? Here we have Christ building the temple of the Lord. But is he building it out of stone? Is he building it out of mortar? Is he building it out of wood? Or is he building it from living stone? One piece, one person at a time. The holy places of the sanctuary in heaven are represented by the two apartments in the sanctuary on earth. As in vision, the apostle John was granted a view of the temple of God in heaven. He beheld there seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Revelation 4, verse 5. He saw an angel having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Revelation 8, verse 3. Here the prophet was permitted to behold the first apartment of the sanctuary in heaven. And he saw there the seven lamps of fire and the golden altar, represented by the golden candlestick and the altar of incense in the sanctuary on earth. Again, the temple of God was open. Revelation eleven nineteen. No symbolism in this verse whatsoever, right? And he looked within the inner veil and upon the holy of holies, and he beheld the ark of his testament, represented by the sacred chest constructed by Moses, to contain the law of God. When this temple of God is opened, and as the reference is being given here to Revelation eleven nineteen, would this not cause us time to pause and reflect upon the events that took place on 9-11-2001? Thus, those who were studying the subject found indisputable proof of the existence of a sanctuary in heaven. What is said today, do many dispute the idea of a sanctuary in 
the heavenly kingdom. Yet here we see those who were studying the subject found indisputable proof of the existence of the sanctuary in heaven. What does it mean to be indisputable? Well, there's no point in fighting about it because it, it exists. Can you dispute this? People. Can, go ahead. But they're, they're denying reality. Okay. Moses made the earthly sanctuary after a pattern which was shown to him. Paul declares that the pattern was the true sanctuary which is in heaven. And John testifies that he saw it in heaven. Now, Moses, who stood above the Old Testament as a giant. Paul, like Moses, who stands above all of the New Testament. And John, the beloved, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the revelator, who reveals that which would happen at the end time. Here we have three witnesses, and yet Mrs. White is a fourth. So do we not have a three-in-one combination telling us that there is indeed a sanctuary in heaven? In the temple of heaven, the dwelling place of God, his throne is established in righteousness and in judgment. In the most holy place is his law, the great rule of right by which all mankind are tested. Does this say that just some mankind are tested by the law? We have all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. We are all tested by the law. The ark that enshrines the tables of the law is covered with the mercy seat, before which Christ pleads his blood in the sinner's behalf. This is represented, thus is represented, the union of justice and mercy in the plan of human redemption. This union infinite wisdom alone could devise an infinite power accomplish. It is a union that fills all heaven with wonder and adoration. The cherubim of the earthly sanctuary, looking reverently down upon the mercy seat, represent the interest with which the heavenly host contemplate the work of redemption. This is the mystery of mercy, which into which angels desire to look, that God can be just while he justifies the repenting sinner and renews his intercourse with the fallen race, that Christ could stoop to raise the unnumbered multitudes from the abyss of ruin and clothe them with the spotless garments of his own righteousness to unite with angels who have never fallen, and to dwell forever in the presence of God. What does that say to you today? What does this offer to you today? And here are angels. <clears throat> they don't understand how a just and holy God can take his law and show such great mercy to those rebels that have turned away from him. And yet, with infinite wisdom, he is reaching to us, seeking restoration and offering restoration for us. Any comment or thought? The work of Christ as man's intercessor is presented in that beautiful prophecy of Zechariah concerning him whose name is the branch, says the prophet. He shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his, the Father's, throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So here we are given this very directly. Christ shall build the temple of the Lord. He will be the cornerstone. Those that are faithful will be the living stones. Christ shall bear the glory and the glory of the Father. He is going to sit and rule upon the throne of the Father. He will be a priest upon 
this throne and the council of peace shall be between the father and the son. Can we find a deeper promise anywhere else in scripture? He shall build the temple. I, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Dwight. I got one. It's um, second, second Corinthians chapter six, verse 16. Okay. It says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Can we all say amen to that? Amen. amen. I was wondering about the them both. Is that, I think it's in Psalm 85, 10. About okay. righteousness and peace. It's both. Okay. Is it talking about the most holy, the holy and the most holy place? In Zechariah six thirteen, the council of peace shall be between them both. Um, I don't know. I know I I um, totally I so need of studying this. So when you're when you're giving reference to that, if we're looking at Psalms eighty five, nine to eleven, and of course nine eleven has no symbol, right? But as we read this <laughs> As we read this, surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Isaiah 54.10 For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. What is the covenant of peace? How would we look at that? Taking hold of Christ for salvation. He said to take hold of his strength. Okay. Any other way? Any other thought? What about the first 13 verses of Leviticus 26? Is oh, that man. Is that not a covenant of peace? Yes, it is. Peace and conformity to the will of God. If we are conformed to the will of God, if we are conformed to his commandments and his statutes, is there any issue between us and the Father, Son, and Spirit? He shall build the temple of the Lord by his sacrifice and meditation. Christ is both the foundation and the builder of the church of God. The Apostle Paul points to him as the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also, he says, are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Ephesians 2:20 20 to 22. Here again. The symbolism of the verse, 220, seeking restoration. The Son of God, heaven's glorious commander, was touched with pity for the fallen race. His heart was moved with infinite compassion as the woes of the lost world rose up before him. But divine love had conceived a plan whereby man might be redeemed. Consider this. For a minute. Divine love had conceived a plan whereby man might be redeemed. It was this counsel that led to the outbreak of jealousy that was found within the great apostate. It was this counsel that he felt he should have been involved with. It is this counsel that led to the rebellion in heaven. That God so loved the world led to sin being found in the world. The broken law of God demanded the life of the sinner. In all the universe, there was but one who could, in behalf of man, satisfy its claims. Since the divine law is as sacred as God himself, only one equal with God could make atonement for its transgression. None but Christ could redeem fallen man from the curse of the law and bring him again into harmony with heaven. 
Christ would take upon himself the guilt and the shame of sin. Sin so offensive to a holy God that it must separate the father and his son. Christ would reach to the depths of misery to rescue the ruined race. What else does this say to you today? What does this offer to us? That's a great reminder there. I mean, it's really one of those shocking statements. Divine law is as sacred as God himself. Right. And of course, it makes me think of all the ways I have violated that law. And really, that puts in me the fear of God. Here is Christ <clears throat> taking upon himself the guilt and the shame of sin. Did Christ sin? No. no. But was he fully under the law as was Adam? Did he have still the propensity to sin? that had come upon the race after 4,000 years of sin. Yes. yes. Consider the symbol for a minute. After 4,000 years of sin, Christ came to offer the messages of Revelation 14 and 18. How many messages do we see here? We have fear God, the first Give glory to him, the second. For the hour of his judgment is come, the third. Come out of her, my people, the fourth, the last. Yet, where are we today? Before the Father, he pleaded in the sinner's behalf, while the host of heaven awaited the result with an intensity of interest that words cannot express. Long continued was that mysterious communing, the council of peace, for the fallen sons of men. The plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth, for Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. Yet it was a struggle, even with the king of the universe, to yield up his son to die for the guilty race. Parents, how many of us would want one of our children to be sacrificed for others? Wouldn't we willingly take their place? No, man. How much of a struggle do you think our Heavenly Father had in allowing Christ to come to this earth? This is the counsel that the adversary believed that he was worthy in which to participate. How could a created being have answered the claims of a just and holy law? But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Is this that we believe in Christ? Is this that we believe in the Father? Is this that we believe in both? So many have believed that it's only faith in Christ. But if we have faith in Christ, do we also not have faith in the Father? Oh, the mystery of redemption, the love of God for a world that did not love him. Who can know the depths of that love which passes knowledge? Through endless ages, immortal minds, seeking to comprehend the mystery of that incomprehensible love, will wonder and adore. Since the whole ritual economy was symbolical of Christ, it had no value apart from him. When the Jews sealed their rejection of Christ by delivering him to death, they rejected all that gave significance to the temple and its services. Its sacredness had departed. It was doomed to destruction. From that day, sacrificial offerings and the service connected with them were meaningless. Like the offering of Cain, they did not express faith in the Savior. In putting Christ to death, the Jews virtually destroyed their temple. When Christ was crucified, the inner veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, signifying that the great final sacrifice had been made and that the system of sacrificial offerings was forever at an end. 
when she wrote this, when she presented this, we have seen that the battle had occurred between Jones, or excuse me, between Wagner and the president of the conference at that time. Was it a law that was nailed to the cross or was it this the ceremonial system? law? Okay. The system of sacrificial offerings. All of this pointed to Christ. Are we to sacrifice lambs, goats, bulls, and other animals for sin today? No, no, no. Thank you. Here we have direction. We know from our studies that another physical man-made temple in Jerusalem will be worthless, yet that there are many today that are more than willing to state that until that third temple is built, Christ cannot return. How can this be the point when we are to be the living stones? All right. They don't know the difference between the little and spiritual. Right. Does it do us any good if a red heifer stands ready to be sacrificed? It would kind of be like blasphemy, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. But what has she already stated here? All of these situations were showing that the Jews had turned their back on the significance of this system of offerings. It had made these offerings worthless. We need to think, consider, and accept that this ritual economy, these symbols, have no value apart from Christ. We cannot afford in any way and in any time, to think that the temple and its services need to be reestablished before Christ can come. Because then we are rejecting what Christ has done for us, and we are choosing to stand under the black banner of the great apostate. Now, have we any have we any other thoughts or comments at this point from what we have covered? Yeah, I'm just looking at uh, Walk to and Fro, and it's uh, H1980. Okay. And then I was thinking of in Job where Satan walked to and fro through the earth, and it also says that the winds could be rational beings. So I was thinking, could they, are they, the directions of the compass, or are these actual spirits that rule north, south, east, and west? And then I was thinking, well, what happened in 1980? I was thinking of, of Desmond Ford, Ford and Glacier View. And so, you know, all these thoughts were going through my head, right? I thought that 1980, so. Well, in 1980, didn't they also have a general conference session in South America where the rank and file accepted the trinity and made their points oh really i believe you'll find that so we will return to this portion of the study this next week consider these things carefully that we have that we have been addressing today so shall we now close with a word of prayer gracious father in heaven we thank you for all that you are doing at this time in this earth and in our lives we ask now, Father, for your blessing. We ask you to guide the speaker that is to come next. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to understand. Be with Theodore on his trip. Help us now so that we might more carefully and completely draw close to you. For this, Father, we thank you. In this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.